Hello, everyone. Everybody feel comfortable? Uh, dinner, breakfast will be served here in just a few minutes. Um, so we'll get everything started. I'm just setting my time so I don't say, keep you guys here for four hours. Um, what we're going to do today, we are going to talk about some really fun stuff today. And because we have a different setup going on, I want to get a little bit more interaction. Uh, I think some things need to happen at the tables. So here's my first thing. Um, I want you to share with the people at your table an embarrassing moment or a time where you got caught. <laughs> an embarrassing moment. Hey, and spouses, feel free to share your spouse's secrets. I mean, no, I mean, don't, no, it's not bad. So really quick, this is it. Take time real quick with the people. I know you know most of them. If you don't know them, you will now. Um, share a moment where you got caught. Or an embarrassing moment. So you got about uh, 35, 40 seconds to do that. Ready, go. For those of you at home, you can just watch us do this for 45 seconds. Sorry. Move with these guys. You want to sit with them? We feel, come on and move in with them. Okay, no cheating now. Just a quick moment. It'll all make sense soon. You can join other tapes. Okay, about another 20 seconds. I know not everybody's going to get a chance. This makes for great TV, I know. How are you guys all doing out there? On your couch, share, your, share those things with those people. You got five seconds. Okay. Which table thinks they have the best one? Is there a table that thinks they have the best one? Somebody want to share? Does, it, does somebody think they have the best embarrassing moment or the best caught moment? Who wants to share it? You'll share it, of course. Now, this is Mike Walcott. Go ahead. Oh, wait, we got a microphone even. Wow. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I was in Vegas, and uh, we had, had fun, and uh, we were walking, one of my buddies was walking me back, and uh, I seen a, a pool, and I was really hot, so I, like, stripped completely naked, went swimming in the pool, my buddy had to, like, back, practically drag me out of the pool and take me back, and as we're walking back to the hotel, I'm getting dressed, so... Is there a police record about this there incident? There is not. No, I would, no, 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 no police record. Ooh, well, yeah, I was like, what happened to that stays? Like, that one probably should have stayed in Vegas. Go back to your seat. Thank you. Go back. Anyone have another one? Doesn't involve nudity? Whew. Okay, well, I'm going to share one of my dumb ones. This just happened two weeks ago. Um, this is two weeks. I was basically, I, there was this car crash happened right in front of me. I got to set the scene. A car crash happened in front of me. It was raining, it was cold. I got out and I checked, make, and I was just driving my personal car, and I'm just like making sure everybody's okay, and I go, man, I gotta go to the restroom now because it's like raining and cold, and that's what happens when you're my age and that happens. So you have to, <laughs> so I go to the Culver's. This is Emerson Avenue at the Culver's over there on Emerson. I go into Culver's, and then I come out, and about that same time, all the Greenwood PD and the fire trucks are rolling up to the accident. I already took care of everything, of course, but they're all rolling up. And I walk up the car, and I, I open this handle, and I pull it open, and this lady goes, you've got the wrong car. <laughs> and I close the door, and I said, I am so sorry. I'm so, I'm so happy I didn't get shot. Now, what makes this worse is those who don't know me very well is this. This was a black sedan car. And you have a white Jeep. I have a white Jeep SUV, <laughs> and my name is on the door of the car. <laughs> it doesn't get any, I'm just like, and you know, they know they, they, they watch me go to my car because they're probably calling the police about that time. Yeah. And I have the, my name is on the side of the car. And you think that I would not make that. So that was an embarrassing moment for me recently. Now, I share about that because we're going to be talking about uh, someone today who got kind of caught in a moment and got kind of exposed. Uh, if this was a book, this would have all the good stuff in it. 
It would have somebody being caught in some adultery type stuff. It would have people caught in, in sin. It would be somebody who had really rough relationships, struggling through life, and then having a moment where they get exposed in, in the broad daylight. They basically get called out in broad daylight. And so today we are going to be speaking about the woman at the well. Now, to help some of you guys relate to this story, I was going to call it woman at the Walmart. Um, <laughs> To help some of you guys get connected with the story, because I know we don't think go hang out at Wells very often, but a lot of us, we do hang out at Walmart, and it's really fun. Um, so we're going to kind of talk, do the one with the well, and we're going to take it from a little bit of a different approach today, at least I think it's different, is we want to look at it as a way, we're going to watch how Jesus interacts with the woman at the well, and it'll make a lot more sense as we get further into the story. But there's going to be some things I want you just to kind of draw your attention to as we go through the story. And you're going to help me teach today, so don't think you're off the hook yet. Um, because I really, I told them on the screens, there's nothing in your notes. It's just the verse. That's all that's in there. Because we're going by what you say today. So this is how this is working today. So, okay. So, as we go through the story, I want you to look for do's and don'ts on connecting with somebody like the woman at the well. And let me tell you about the woman at the well before we even get to the story. She was from a city called Samaria. She was a Samaritan woman, which normally meant that she had been part of a Jewish culture that had then got intermixed with, I think, the Assyrians. The Assyrians, they got mixed in. They got mingled together. And now we're kind of the outcasts. They took some Jewish traditions. They mixed it with this. They mixed it with that. Mixed it with it. And now it's just they're kind of a hodgepodge. The Jews normally would walk around this area would walk around it because it was just safer. They didn't feel like safe. They didn't feel like God, these people were kind of unclean. They really weren't the best people. They did things different. They didn't have any morals is how the Jews felt. And so they would walk around the city. So we're going to walk into a scene, and you got to have that's kind of, obviously, that's kind of the scene that we're setting today. And we're going to walk into it. And at certain points, I'm just going to stop, and I'm going to ask you guys to help me out a little bit. What is it that you think that Jesus was doing and why? And what are some things that the Samaritan woman was doing in response? And I think we're going to find these are going to break down into a couple of different categories. There's going to be things that basically you're going to see, especially from the Samaritan woman, that we're going to find are protections and things that she does to kind of push back. And there's going to be things you're going to see Jesus does to go forward. So as we kind of go through the story, we're going to run into some of these. So let's just kind of start with the story. This is woman at the well out of John 4. Let me read the first part of it. So, so he left Judea and went back once from Galilee. Now, here's the funny part, and this is just catching after what I just said. Now, he had to go through Samaria. What did I just say about most Jews? They went around Samaria. Why would Jesus go through Samaria? He was a Jew. He does things a little bit different than the Jews. He was breaking down some things. What else? What do you guys think? Why, why would he go through Samaria? He didn't care. So he's trying to spread God's presence. What was over here? No, somebody else? God's will, willed him to go there? Shorter distance. Shorter distance. Well, always, men always thinking practical. That's a shorter way to go. Yes, what do you think? Beautiful. He knew she was going to be there. And it just kind of takes this thing from a, a level where we just think we're doing our daily business to if we start looking at how Jesus did things, things were intentional. There was a reason and a purpose. There was the potential for an encounter with Jesus ready to take place if someone was willing to cut through the rough stuff, the rough area, to get there. And so these are some lessons we can already start learning from just the get-go. There is a reason and a purpose for going through Samaria instead of around. Because Jesus knew there was about to be an encounter. An encounter that would have long-lasting, eternal impact. Versus the easy way around. Even though it's a little longer, I don't have to deal with those people. I'm good to go. And let's be honest, we do this all the time, don't we? Isn't this what we do? Oh my gosh, they're in the hallway. Let's go this way. Woo! They didn't see me in that aisle, did they? And, we, and there's people you, you do that with. Because you, but God's calling us saying, we have to live an intentional life where every encounter has the potential to introduce a mo an encounter with Jesus. 
And so that's the first thing we have to start thinking through. Okay, so let's move on. We didn't even make it out of the first two verses. Here we go. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sakar. I always pronounce the things wrong. Near the plot of the ground, J- uh, ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the, jur- from he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, this is like, what's it to say? This is midnight at Walmart now, okay, in our mentality. Noon at the well was basically the time that you only came out there because it's hot as a day. It's really hot there. All the other women would come early in the morning, get out before the heat kicked in. This woman, though, is about to walk in to the story during a time when she could be hidden. She could avoid all the, 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 the looks, the jeers, the conviction feelings, the guilt. She would do what she could to avoid it. So she's walking in around noon, and so here's what happens. Um, let's see. He knew he was, he was, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had already gone. They would kind of left him. They went off to dinner. They had gone off to get, buy some food in the town. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. What was the first thing that Jesus did that was to make the moment go net further? What did he do? What did he do? He asked for something. How about just the fact that he talked to her? That threw her off, didn't it? That she even had a conver- he, would, he would strike up a conversation, and he did, she didn't know he was the son of God at that time. She didn't know he was the Messiah. All she knew was that a Jew? talking to me and so one of the first things i just want to kind of make sure we cover and we get into here is this one of the most important things that we can do is talk to people if you're an introvert i'm going to challenge you to to build relationships and interactions in your own way where you have a conversation with people because god has called each and every one of us to what we're hearing here, to help people have an encounter with him. That is our job. We're here to help build encounters with Jesus. And one of the easiest and most simple ways is just talk. Because when I talk to somebody, I'm already saying that I don't feel I'm better than you. I'm not. I'm saying I want to have a conversation with you. I'm interested in you. I care about you. Simply by talking. Jesus could have sat there. They could have sat there side by side. And it would just grow in her descent for Jews. But just by talking, he didn't really need a drink, let's be honest. I'm sure he, thir- he, wanted, I'm sure he was thirsty, but he didn't need a drink. He didn't need her to get it for him. He came to serve instead of be served. But it was a way to create a conversation. What was her, how did she rebuke, re- how did she come back at it though? What did, what did she throw at him? You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Who brought up the differences? She did. And one of the things I find interesting is this, and we find ourselves a lot of times, we, we find ourselves arguing over things that really don't matter. She's bringing up, she's basically, this is almost her tactic of pushing Jesus away. Hey, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. Stay in your lane. But that is not how Jesus saw it. But that is an initial reaction that people have when they're even, let's just be honest, if you believe in spiritual warfare, one of the ways that the evil side, demons, whatever you want to call it, that is the flesh, to push things away, is to create divisions between people. It's to push people away. And we try doing it. And if I was going to say, uh, by race, by, uh, she basically also throws in the women. Women should, uh, I'm a woman. Why are you even a man talking to me? It's breaking societal barriers to Jesus. When he started speaking with her, he broke through two barriers right away. He broke through the fact that she was of a different race, whatever. He broke through that she was a woman. In one question, he broke through all that, and it shocked her. But a very typical pushback that you'll see from people who you're trying to lead to Christ is they're going to be pointing out the differences. They're going to be say they're going to be pushing race. They're going to be pushing. Um, they're going to be pushing their differences, how they were brought up. They're going to be pushing all of their culture, whatever it might be. They're going to try creating differences instead of realizing that we were all made in God's image and God cares about each and every one of them. And so Jesus did that. 
So one of the things I'll say, uh, things not to argue about. Don't argue about this because it's kind of funny how Jesus always goes back and he responds directly right back to her. Let's look at how he responds. Um, you were a Jew. She brings up all this stuff. But here's what he says. If you knew the gift of God and who was, it is that asked you to ask you for, I can't read today. Shit, have you guys, we do that unison reading thing. Uh, if you knew the, the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She's coming in, hey, 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 stay in your lane. He's going, hey, I don't care about that. What I'm more worried about, I'm more worried about your spiritual. <clears throat> and I have something that's going to blow you away. I have something, uh, living water. Maybe we say it's an abundant life. I have something that's going to give you joy. I have something that's going to give you peace. I have something that's going to bring uh, a guilt-free life to you. I have this for you. You can talk about all that other stuff. You can talk about our differences. But what I know is that every one of us has a need and a desire for those things. And so instead of looking at the differences, Jesus looked for the things that we all have in common, some deep needs, spiritual needs that each one of us in our heart. And so when we talk to people, we have to know that our story and our message that we have to give to people is something they really need. They might not even know it. They might have barriers, man-made barriers to put in front of you, but they know down inside, and we know there's a hole that's meant for Jesus. When you see people, is that how you see them? When you're walking around life, do you see, do you just brush them off? Oh, they're different. They're the kid I just took my eyes, bought some of the, the BP station over here, he had more piercings coming out of his face than I thought was possible. He had tattoos behind those. And I could, I mean, you're just like, but you know what? You take all that stuff off. He has a whole design for Jesus inside of him. And that's how we have to see people and get past the man-made barriers. Because when we throw man-made barriers like she did, Jesus looks directly at the spiritual because he knows what they really need. And so he talks about abundant life. And we, and we basically, our goal is to basically tell people, hey, you have this need. I know where to find it, how to fill that void Jesus is the one. It's okay to talk about an abundant life. Let's look how she goes on a little bit further. <clears throat> she goes, sir, uh, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us a well, the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? He basically is talking about living water. He's talking about abundant life. And she comes back now with, <laughs> um, I'm just telling you, what are you thinking? It's down there. You can't even get to it. She's still thinking in this physical realm. She's still thinking of the hindrances of the physical realm that are keeping her and him <clears throat> from getting to this living water. Now, we do it a little bit different nowadays. Nowadays, what we run into is reasoning. And it's one of the things that we find ourselves that people start throwing up when we start getting this close to them and start talking about spiritual things. Uh, we'll throw out things in, in our modern-day reasoning would be, um, what about the dinosaurs? What about that flood thing? Did that really happen? You're telling me a whale ate a guy for three days and split him up and puked him out? <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Okay, okay. <laughs> we, we, we start getting into these things of reasoning, and she's still thinking in this earthly world and that's where a lot of people who you're trying to reach out to, that's where they're stuck. They're stuck in the science of it all. They want to have everything proven out. They want everything laid out for them this exactly. I can prove God this way. How do you prove there's a God with science? I don't know. It's a supernatural being. He's beyond this. He's not held to this realm. He's not held to the physical realm. And you're going to try to prove it with science? Now, I'm not saying we're all illogical. I'm not saying we just, let's just all dumb down because we're Christian. That is not it. But the biggest need, and we, God will work through some of those things. I'll be honest. I drove here in a car. I know two things about a car. Gas, key. <laughs> it got me here just fine. I don't know how the dumb thing works. There are people way smarter than me. Who am I to think that I'm going to understand how the universe works? I can't figure out a car. So we don't know everything. 
we probably don't have the ability to understand all this. And then be honest, and here's how we're going to see how Jesus responds with him, with her. Her pushback is reasoning. Her pushback is world. Her pushback is earthly, tangible things. He pushes back in a different way. Let's look how he pushes back. Um, let me see where Matt, where's my end? 13, here we go. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in, become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. She's thinking man-made barriers. He's thinking spiritual needs again. And I think this is where we break down as some people trying to share Christ with people. We think we have to know all these things figured out ourselves. We don't. And in some instances, we can't. We think we have to have all these things. Well, they're a science person. You know what I can bypass science? When somebody passes away and that family is hurting, they don't need me to sit there and tell them why and how they died. They want somebody there. The emotions, the love, the caring, the comfort, those are not studied by science. They can't be created by science. But they're there. And that is the need that Jesus knew that she had, that she had a need to know, where am I going to spend eternity? Is this all life has to offer? Is this it? Is this all I'm going to be? I'm going to go to the well in the afternoon, and this is all I'm going to do. Is that it? He cut through the chase. He goes, what you're really worried about, what the big concern is, what's my purpose? How's my life going to end? What happens after this life? Those are the things that make people t- think, and it cuts through all the science. You have plenty of time to figure out the science because that's what you want to do. But what I know is you have a need to have a plan in your life that's beyond this world, and God has one for you. So when we talk to people, don't get bogged down. Don't argue about science. Don't argue about dinosaurs. Don't argue about floods. Whenever that stuff comes up, just go right back to, here's the need I know you have. Here's something I know you stress out about. Here's something I know when you lay in bed at night and you look at all those stars and you go, where do I fit in? That's what we care about. I've never had a 13-year-old come up to me and go, can you explain this to me? You know, and about some of the flood. They're usually, I'm lonely. I'm hurting. I want to feel accepted. And I think it's the same way for adults. Same thing for the woman at the well. Let's move a little bit further. Uh... 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't be, get thirsty and have to keep coming here for, to draw water. She's still thinking water. He's thinking spiritual. Go call your husband and come back. Okay, remember I told you why your embarrassing moment was important? Because she just got called out. And here's why. I have no husband, she replied. And here he goes. <laughs> Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have... The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you're now, you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, one of the things that we as Christians and people trying to really care for somebody, what we usually are afraid to talk about is sin. And it's okay to talk about sin. It's okay to talk about it with people that these are things in your life that are probably not what God desires. Now, a few warnings. If you can't wait to tell them about their sin, you're the wrong person. Find someone else. Oh, I can't wait to tell them how bad they are. Come on, on, let's bring it on. You're wrong. Wrong person, wrong attitude, wrong heart. Get yourself straight, then go. Number two reason people usually don't want to talk about sin is because they have them in their own lives. And they believe that that disqualifies them from ministry from being a witness. They think, I have a sin. Who am I to tell them how to live their life? If I call them out, they're going to just come right back on me on my sin. They're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong. So why should I? I'm not going to start that process. I don't want to be exposed. Man, she got got exposed. And these fears are what keeps us from ever reaching out and doing as Jesus did. Now, it was much easier for him because he was perfect. And he hadn't done any of the sins. But the Bible time and time again talks about people who had a lot of dirty laundry, who were used to reach people beyond even their dreams. 
Um, I have a brother, my oldest brother, he has, uh, he has cancer. Now, my oldest brother's a doctor. Through all, he's, he's one of those really smart people. He's one of those guys that you're like, hey, I got this bump, and he has some, like, four-foot name. Oh, that's a transducian such-and-such, cup of cup is something or other. And his big, really long name, you go, oh, it's a pimple? Yes. <laughs> He'll have some big name where it's a pimple. You know, that's it. That's good. WebMD said I had a tumor, so I'm glad it's just a pimple, you know? So he's really, really smart. He's been through experience. He went to war and fought, well, fought, went with these special forces guys and was putting them back together when they got back from combat, all this crazy stuff. He has cancer. If you were struggling and you, were, you had cancer, who do you want to talk to? A cancer survivor, don't you? All that knowledge my brother has doesn't go to waste just because he has cancer. He still works on patients. He still rebuilds people who have come, had mastectomies, and he rebuilds. He does reconstruction stuff. He can still do all of that, even though that's still, and and his a little bit, he still has his cancer. It's not gone. It's just there. We can still reach out and minister to people in the midst of our own struggles. In fact, sometimes that becomes a partnership and a relationship that's going to grow deeper because it's going to be two people working and relying on God together, praying for each other, sharing what their stresses and their strains with one another. And that's sometimes how we make it through things. Instead of putting ourselves in a bubble, instead of putting these man-made barriers between us and people, that's what happens. Let's look how Jesus responds. Uh, says, Jesus, you're, you're right to us. I don't see where you're. So he basically just goes right. He said, you are quite true. You had more than one. You have more than one husband. Uh, here she goes again, verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this place where we, we must worship is in Jerusalem. This is basically, once again, her just trying to throw out some religious stuff that becomes a barrier. Religion becomes a barrier. Let's move on. Verse 21, the good stuff. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for this salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Basically, a lot to say, you're with me. The time is here. Forget about all the religious stuff. Forget about those barriers. The pathway for you, even as a Samaritan, has been paved with what Jesus is doing. And he's opening it up. Um, The woman says this. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He basically, just expe- he just basically said, all this stuff that you've been worried about, all these barriers you've been throwing up, all of that stuff, you just said the Messiah will clear the way. The Messiah will be the one to do this. He goes, I'm the one here to clear the way for even you, a sinner, you, a Samaritan. I provided a path for even you to come closer and have an encounter with God, an encounter with Jesus. And I think we get so bogged down often with all the barriers that we put up and throw things. It's either our own personal fears. It's the barriers that the person throws at us. We try to think, oh, I got to convince, convince them. You don't have to convince them. Your job is to bring them into a moment to encounter Jesus. Um, I said a lot of this, but I think sometimes for me, I'm just more of a practical learner when it comes to things. I want to show you a video. And let me just set up the video. Uh, a, a man named uh, Botham Jean was 26 years old. He was sitting in his living room of his apartment on the fourth floor, room 4178, of an apartment in Dallas, Texas. He was eating his bowl of ice cream, and he was just having a night. No big deal. A police officer was coming home after her 13-hour shift, and she parked on the fourth floor. She would lived in this apartment complex for about two months, and she was walking in, and she was going home after her 13-hour shift. She was talking on the phone to somebody on the phone, and she walks in the door. The problem is she lived at 
apartment 3178, 3178, and he lived at 4178. The build, each level of the apartment building were identical. The only difference was a red mat out in front of one room 4178. She walked in the door believing she was walking into her own apartment. She saw a shadowy silhouette figure in the back of in her home, obviously with both of them, who was in his own apartment, gets up, starts walking because some woman just walked into his apartment. I would be doing the same thing. She shot and killed him, thinking that he was an intruder in her home. This was a big national news, 2018. And this case was used for a lot of division. This case was used for a lot of uh, uh, ways to bash police, bash whites, bash black. It was just, it was just it was a mess. What I want to show you, though, is the victim impact statement of his brother, Brant Gene. He's 18 years old. It's a little bit of a long video, but I hope you can kind of bear with me. This video, I want you to see, and the things that we've just kind of talked about, how this is going to illustrate some of the things we just talked about in the story. So let's watch the video. It is four minutes long. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes.
powerful, isn't it? It's amazing when you see the faith and the, the act of forgiveness in person, how it just draws people. She couldn't even let go of him. She didn't want to leave. She was drawn right back to that embrace. When we can truly show people the path to forgiveness, they'll be drawn to it. You won't have to do any convincing. You won't have to do any manipulating of people. They'll be drawn to it. When they truly feel that people are loving and accepting and forgiving them, we could throw out all the different reasons why these two people should not be hugging in a courtroom. It's the wrong location. It's the wrong setting. It's the wrong people. It's everything you think about, every divide there could possibly be. And an 18-year-old who had the guts to say, hey, I forgive you, changed the entire dynamic of that situation and had a greater impact than what most of us will achieve ever. But that is the, the enactment and embodiment. Jesus was our perfect example. And there's a young man trying to step out and be that example also in his world. The story didn't just stop there. Kind of interesting. Uh, she was convicted. Physically, she was convicted for 10 years in prison. After she was convicted, the judge, who was often also an African-American woman, she gives out, she goes and hugs the, the victim's families. She then goes back into her, the, her chambers and comes back out and goes to the the suspect, her name was Amber Geiger, and goes to Amber and hands her a Bible. And she, let me read what she said. This is the conversation that was picked up on video. You can go back and look at it. It says this. She hands Amber Geiger her Bible and says, here you go. You can have mine. I have three or four more at home. This is the one I use every day. This is your job for the next month. Read John 3.16. She then hugs Amber, the judge. Amber says, you are so good. The judge responds, it's not because I'm good. It's because I believe in Jesus Christ. I am not so good. You haven't done so much that you can't be forgiven. You did something bad in, in a one moment of time. What you do now matters. Isn't that powerful? We're called to create and be a part of these kind of encounters. Now, that's dramatic, caught on camera. But it's just as dramatic if you find somebody who's struggling. And some people, maybe it wasn't just one moment of time like the woman at the well. It's been a lifetime of struggles. But when you're the one there and you can guide them to a, to a, a, a father, a Jesus, who forgives them, who died on a cross for their sins, and you can just say, Jesus wants to forgive you. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about him. And you're sharing your personal, your personal stuff with them. That's going to be more connecting. That's evangelism. Now, we see it play out in the woman at the well because she goes back to her Samaria, this place that nobody, the Jews, didn't really care for. And she starts sharing with people. And I bet the first people she shared with weren't the top religious leaders. She went back to people just like her and said, there's this man who knew, knew everything about me and still loved me. And still cared for me. He didn't condemn me. He loved me. He didn't worry about all the other stuff I was dealing with. And all the other barriers I created. He loved me. If we can do that. If we can do that. We could double the number of people in this room in a week. A month. Whatever. Not because we're manipulating. But we're just offering people. That there is a God who loves them. And forgives them. But we have to break through our personal barriers, our fears. We have to open our eyes to look for intentional contacts and moments where we can do this. That is your challenge. That is your challenge. I pray that you have at least one opportunity to lead someone to a Jesus encounter this year. We're heading into Easter. People who don't even usually go to church will show up on church. And we're going to speak a beautiful message. Jim's will do a great job, I'm sure. But you know what's going to matter most? The conversations that happen before and after that. Sitting at the dinner table, talking to them. Sitting with the family member who you just don't even want to see anymore. 
intentional conversations to bring encounters with Jesus. She went to her town and shared everything. A man who knew everything about me and still loved me. They go to Jesus, say, Jesus, we don't want you to leave. I like that, those embraces. I, once I found something, like, I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to leave. He stayed for a couple more days. Like the entire town got saved. That's what we're called to. If you feel like the woman at the well more than the, the other one, then you might need to talk to somebody because I want to lead you to an encounter with Jesus.